Okay, everyone, welcome back to another episode of Breaking the Spell. And for today's topic, uh, it is a book review, but you know, I suspect this is going to be more than just that. It's really a philosophical or political philosophical uh, breakdown of the idea of freedom. And in this case, we will have a related topic, which is capitalism. So the book title is called Capitalism versus Freedom, and the subtitle is The Toll Road to Serve Them. It's written by this uh, person called Rob Larson, and he's a um, professor in economics. So um, to first kind of introduce the book a little bit, um, the best way to think about it is that this book kind of serves as a effective service uh, in terms of providing intellectual self-defense. Uh, when it comes to talking about the dogmas of the free market capitalists. So just to give you an idea, um, there are certain gurus out there. Um, they've been around for years. About, sorry, their ideas have been around for years. Uh, these people, um, you will know them as uh, economists such as Milton Freeman, uh, Friedrich Hayek, Ludwig von Mises, Ayn Rand, and Murray Rothbard. And this um, consort of thinkers and economists they're extremely influential, and essentially their ideology is free market capitalism, which essentially uh, libertarianism, libertarianism capitalism, which is essentially an idea about maximizing voluntary uh, associations, autonomy, and political freedom uh, in the marketplace. So a funny thing about the book, um, why it's titled this way is because Milton Freeman wrote a book called Capitalism and Freedom, and Frederick Hayek wrote a book called The Road to Serve Them. So, this is actually Rob's way of uh, trolling uh, their, their book titles, yeah. So in any case, right, uh, in our previous videos, you know, we have used words like class, capitalism, free market, and perhaps, you know, we didn't take the chance to try to break down this term. So with this video, I hope we can do a little bit of that. Uh, and the reason why I chose to discuss this topic is because I think we all have been faced with this um, perpetual and ubiquitous debate about our work conditions, about the state of society today. And we have folks, um, there are a, couple, a range of them, right? There's a huge group of them, from capitalists to what we call techno-optimists, people who believe that technology will save us, uh, political leaders especially, sometimes usually called the right-wing political leaders, uh, right-wing political wing. And they proclaim essentially that we live in much better times than before. We have eradicated slavery, to some of them, they think we've eradicated racism and oppression and social injustice. So we are living in a essentially free society and there's no more work to be done. We are all free agents. Uh, Francis, Francis Fukuyama, uh, a American political scientist, has termed capitalism as the end of history. And he doesn't see any need for us to change um, this uh, system that we live in anymore. So in any case, it's everywhere. You know, In Singapore, we had discussions about uh, inequality, social mobility. And so the argument will rear its head again that we are free to pursue our own paths in life, hence it justifies inequality. Um, we also in Singapore have arguments about the restriction of freedoms for homosexuals, restriction of freedoms for freedom of expression. So I think you can see even beyond capitalism, beyond our work economic conditions, uh, this issue of freedom comes up wherever we go. So I'm just going to first uh, start with just describing uh, or breaking down the philosophical content first, uh, you know, uh, what do we mean by freedom? Then after which we guys will have a discussion. Uh, so we won't talk about the political aspect, capitalism yet. Uh, after I do that, uh, then we can talk about capitalism and go on to other areas of the book. So um, to start off with, what is freedom? And in the book, Rob actually provides this definition by John Stuart Mill, it's used everywhere. So the quote from John Stuart Mill on liberty, uh, is, it, it goes like this. The nature and limits of the power which can be legitimately exercised by society over the individual with the sole end for self-protection and prevent harm to others. So essentially, uh, what governments do is um, they have the ability to uh, direct the actions of other people and also to make individuals or groups uh, to do what the government wills. So this can be exercised uh, obviously in different ways by different groups and, and it's different institutions do it in different ways. Uh, but the idea is essentially this, the more government, uh, the more power the government has, the less freedom or less liberty that we have. That's kind of the essential equation. So a good example of this is free speech. So if the government has more uh, control over our speech, obviously there's less uh, freedom for us to, to talk about what we want. And when there is a certain group of um, 
freedoms that's categorized together distinctly, uh, they're called rights. So for example, you know, healthcare rights or rights to um, your own body. So in any case, right, when it comes to uh, John Stuart Mill's um, um, breakdown of uh, liberty, he does see that there are cases where power is legitimate. So for example, if the government orders you to go to court or you have to serve jury duty, there are instances where the government has a legitimate use of power. But generally speaking, um, and even in this world right now, especially with the free, free market libertarians, what they like to see is a world where government is severely limited and there is a lot more freedom for people to uh, exercise their rights to say, building up their business, uh, to speak their own mind and, you know, in certain instances, uh, right to your own body. So that can include rights to suicide or abortion. So we are going now to the meat of uh, what is going to be today's discussion, which is two concepts of liberty. So this comes from the British philosopher Isaac Berlin, and he considers two concepts, negative and positive uh, liberty or freedom. So I'll talk about negative first, and essentially is what uh, I just elaborated just now, which is a minimum area of personal freedom where it cannot be violated, right? Um, so just like what I said about um, free speech, the idea is that, you know, there's a certain amount of speech that I should be entitled to be able to exercise. So the thing is that for Isaac Berlin, there are, th this negative concept of freedom is still quite limited. It's not really a true meaning of freedom. And uh, what Rob actually talks about in the book is that we can imagine a scenario where you have a liberal-minded despot, and he allows his subjects a huge degree of personal freedom. So the freedom from coercion from government, you don't have to do slave labor, you don't have to, um, you know, you, you, you'll be uh, free from being unlawfully detained and, and in prison. So there's that kind of, uh, you know, free from that kind of violation. But nevertheless, you can still have a despot who gives that kind of uh, liberty, but he can be unjust, he can encourage widest inequality, he can care very little for order, and there's some political leaders like that. Uh, and he can, you know, just essentially not do very much. As long as, uh, he, can, he can allow a lot of injustice to happen as long as he doesn't curb the liberties of individuals and citizens. So in that sense, even though this meets the definition of negative liberty, but it doesn't have to be uh, correlated with democracy or even self-government. So that's negative. When it comes to positive freedom, um, is the opposite. It's actually about the ability to, to be free to do what you will, right? And that there are power structures or legal system, or maybe the power of the law that allows you to do those things. So that can be the right to vote, um, the right to have a say in, in, in how your company is run, uh, and even the right to share in economic prosperity of a country. Uh, these freedoms, uh, have they do evolve over time. So for example, in the past, you, you can't say uh, when the farmer cannot be a surgeon, you, you can't say that, you know, those freedoms didn't exist. They didn't exist for a lot of uh, material reasons, right? But now, if, for example, there's a society that uh, does not allow someone from a low income to become of a high income, then you can argue that that freedom doesn't exist. So in any case, um, one of the things that Rob points out is that there is a danger to overreach when it comes to positive freedom, because it also means you give authoritarians power to control individual behavior on the grounds that these authoritarians should be free to order people around to achieve their ambitions. Uh, they're quoting directly here, he says, it can be at times no better than a specious disguise for brutal tyranny. So, you know, to me, think of an example of maybe a leader which has support, who has the positive freedom to order people to work six days a week versus five days a week, um, or maybe a CEO that decides how much salaries uh, his workers should, should deserve to have and how much he deserves to have. You know, and maybe even a leader who may have draconian uh, policies on, on certain things like drugs. So anyway, nevertheless, um, going back to Isaac Berlin anyway, is that he does see value in both categories of freedom, right? And he feels that ultimately there is satisfaction that has been met um, um, for the two, both of them, so that uh, there's an equal right um, that can be classed among the deepest interests of mankind. Okay, so that's the philosophy part. I'd like to get from both of you, you know, uh, a sense of like what you feel about this framework and perhaps you may know about the thinkers who have dealt with this issue of freedom. Santosh, why don't you go first? Yeah, I, I would like to, uh, I'm a person who likes to string different schools of thoughts together. So the idea of negative freedom and like positive freedom, right, is actually encapsulated 
uh, in Donut Economics by Kate Rawat, in that you have you need to have strong social foundations where you have respect for basic human rights, and you address and you build a strong enough social foundation where you address all the negative uh, freedoms, yeah, which actually infringe on the rights of a few to uh, dignity, to employment, to education or other rights. And then you have also, you need to have limits on positive freedom, which is the ecological ceiling in the donut economics model of Kate Rawa, which limits growth and freedoms that actually transgress certain planetary boundaries or natural boundaries. So I, I, I like to actually, yeah, we talked about donut economics in quite a number of our conversations. And I see that donut economics, the inner ring and the outer ring are really congruent with the model of positive freedoms and negative freedoms that you talked about. So that is just one, one way of stringing this with all the other talks that we've had in the other videos. Wow, that's wonderful, beautiful. I would never have thought of that, but you're absolutely right. Yeah, it's a great way to look at uh, donor economics. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think this framework of negative and positive freedoms came about because of like politics and political philosophy. This need to figure out like the relationship between government and its citizens. Um, but if I were to bring it down to like a personal level, like why do we care about freedom, right? It's, it's a feeling, you know, like I think we all intuitively know it when we feel free or we don't feel free. And it may have nothing to do with what a government is doing. You know, it's just like even without the influence of a government, if like I'm, I'm a smoker and I'm addicted to cigarettes, I may not feel free. In, in a really deep sense. Um, so I think that that's ultimately what matters to people. And I think it would be great if we had governments that actually attended to that subjective feeling of freedom. You know, what does it feel like to be free and how can we enhance that in our citizens? You know, if, we, if you actually to do surveys and each year, your goal is to just have your people's sense of freedom like increase. That would be progress. Yeah, uh, that's actually one point that would relate really well. Before, like I said, uh, the next segment where we talk about capitalism, let's try to use this topic on freedom, right? On the issue of uh, taking a local issue, uh, homosexual rights in Singapore. So uh, just to give a breakdown for people who may not know, like in Singapore, of course, you're free to be a homosexual. Uh, you're totally allowed to exercise your rights, your, your, your freedom to, you know, dress what you want, be who you want. Um, but there is one legal clause, and that's one that the Singapore Society is fighting for, which is Section 377A. And that, uh, that legal clause actually penalizes um, uh, gay sex in particular, not lesbians, um, but in particular male homosexual sex. Now, of course, uh, uh, the, the law, um, well, sorry, the police in Singapore would say, you know, we hardly enforce it although it's in the books, but the idea is that they rarely had to use it. Still though, the idea is that they have the positive freedom to exercise on it. On the other hand, going back to what we just said, right? Um, there are people who are not too bothered about this, or uh, people who defend 377A by saying, look, the people, homosexuals still have negative freedom because generally they are free from coercion. They are not oppressed. That's what some of these people think. And it goes back to what Ong Su says, right? Which is, but are we paying attention to the subjective uh, feelings of freedom because the homosexuals who still feel victimized by this particular uh, legal legal lease, right? They would actually argue that we don't feel that free because we still feel that as long as this uh, legal uh, clause hangs over our heads, we are always going to be stigmatized and viewed as uh, as 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 the other, and and um, they believe that by actually demolishing it, even if like even as we said, even if it's not truly exercised by by the police, but at least it gives uh, a certain symbolic uh, um, respect to their freedoms that they are supposed to have, yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a great example. Um, and I would say, even if we didn't have section, the section 3778 law, um, you know, even if the, the laws were fine on, on a legal level, like 
Like there was nothing, no negative judgment on homosexuality from a legal point of view. I might still say homosexuals might still not feel free if, if they, they wake up in the morning and they're worried about what their friends are gonna think of them, what their parents are gonna think of them. They don't feel free to, to put up a photo of themselves and their partner at work. Um, on a subjective level, I would say they're still not free, even if from a legal point of view, like it looks like they're free. Absolutely. Uh, I'm currently on the Alliance for Action for Low Wage Workers because I care about the rights for low wage workers. And uh, essential to the discussion about subjective feelings of freedom, um, I think the idea of dignity is something that is subjective and that is very palpable and it needs to be taken into consideration when it comes to voting rights or freedom of speech or freedom to uh, to be given uh, a resource when it's allocated to you. And I would like to also have a deeper discussion on the whole idea of capitalism where people who own the factors of production actually decide on how resources are allocated. And in doing so, they might deny some of the workers who work for them, some of their most fundamental human rights like dignity at the very core of it, which is something you can feel. And these are some conversations we don't even have in our society because we relegate and we, we push aside discussions on dignity, which is subjective, to objective measures of absolute wages have increased so far. And so the situation has improved and capitalism has worked. The tripartism model that we have in Singapore, where you try to mediate between the powers that the government has, employers have, and the people or the workers have, is something that has worked, and you justify it through objective measures of increase in well-being that the society has overall. And you, you say that low-wage workers have increased levels of well-being because the, the, the objective measures for income have increased, uh, wages uh, and well-being have increased and uh, poverty has reduced. Yeah, but we've never ever asked ourselves about subjective levels of well-being for our low-wage workers. Okay, very good uh, point that you brought up, Santosh. Just hold on to that thought because before I get to the capitalism, just one more thing I'd like to talk about before we get there. Because going back to the homosexual case, right? Now, here's where things get interesting because we then have this other group of people um, and those are the religious groups who claim we, have, we need to also possess that right to exercise uh, religious liberty. And in some cases, they actually use that as a weapon against homosexual rights. So as we know in America, there is this constant battle as we're bridging on for many years where um, Christians, uh, fundamentalists, let's put it that way, um, they try to take over powers of the state and they try to then um, implement laws that would, um, you know, more or less either discriminate uh, homosexuals or uh, ban abortions. There's one very particular case study where this particular baker did not want to bake a cake for two lesbians, uh, if I recall correctly. So it happened like some years back. Can't remember the outcome right now, but my suspicion is, is that he put, probably the law still dictates that this person has to perform their act of uh, service because you're not supposed to discriminate uh, on the basis of sexuality, gender, ethnicity, etc. So in any case, well, I just want to bring it to you guys because I think this is always something we can't escape from. There will be certain groups out there who will say, hey, you know, uh, our right to exercise our freedom, which is the positive freedom aspect, um, is also something we need to treasure. What do you make of that? Yeah, no, I think I, I thought of this too. Like, I, you know, it, it's... Uh... You know, even just taking out, let's say, the aspect of religion, because that's very charged, right? But let's just say there's a group of people that feel disgust when they look at homosexuals, uh, you know, uh, displaying like public displays of affection in, in, in public, right? And, and so they're saying, this gives me a subjective feeling of disgust. It, it's a subjectively negative feeling and they want to be protected from it. So here you have a situation where two different groups, uh, subjective feelings of freedom or happiness are in conflict. And how do you actually, uh, you know, be, yeah, how, how do you 
weigh that, weigh those yeah. two subjective feelings, right? And I wonder, like at the end of the day, maybe is there a way to just actually look at it empirically? Like you can, you, we know that the, you know, homosexuals go through so much distress that some of them commit suicide, uh, you know, that there's actually a, a, a lot of like uh, hard medical uh, experiences that they go through. Um, whereas on the other side, you know, the, the person who's being discussed, I don't know, I don't know if there's any <laughs> documented case of someone committing suicide because they've been forced to expose to this, right? Um, I don't know what would you guys think of, of how you actually weigh those two. Santosh, you want to go ahead first? Yeah, no, I think uh, what is inherently taught in all uh, religions or all faiths is to, uh, to cater for and to take care of those who are minorities and those who are marginalized in any society and to take care of people's feelings, to be very mindful of uh, the hurt we might cause to other people, uh, which could be intentional or unintentional, but to be consciously aware and to grow and to realize that we are imperfect and, and I think uh, discriminating someone based on their sexuality is not something that is, that is actually, if you look at the major religions and the books of most uh, religions, it's not something that is um, uh, condoned, actually. It's all about compassion. It's all about centering marginal, marginalized voices. It's all about... Uh, understanding where there are vacuums of power and where there are concentrations of power and doing what it takes to take care of those with less power. So I think the whole idea of compassion is a, is, is a far more important virtue than the other legalistic interpretations that you can find in some of these uh, religions of faith. Yeah, and so I think if you want to have a holistic discussion on faith, then you need to explore both ends. The legalistic interpretation that some organized religion religious groups might have of some of the text and the whole idea of compassion as a virtue that you should be practicing irrespective of who the person is in front of you. Okay, so um, it's an interesting line of thought because um, to me, sometimes when I uh, interact with religious folks, of course, I don't sense from them that they hate homosexuals. So they will still accept them for who they are. But the question is when it comes to when it comes to legal rights or when it comes to certain things that the homosexual has a community to seek. So let's take marriage, right? So some of them we would like to see a right for them to marry each other. That's where the conflict arises because it's not about compassion anymore. For these religious folks, they feel that you by uh, bestowing a right to marriage for homosexual, it violates their sense of uh, what marriage is supposed to be all about. So I think it's just like the case of abortion. I mean, of course, uh, if someone has an abortion, it's not like it's actually harming someone else, but it's just that people want to contest with what the society should condemn uh, as a you know social virtue or vice. So actually, to Santosh's uh, sorry sorry to Ang Su's question, how I would arbitrate among this is actually go back to John Stuart Mill's definition, which I just stated just now, and the two um, the two ends right, the objectives of having liberty, which is to for self protection and prevent harm to others. So when it comes to the homosexual case, to me, it can be easily argued that granting homosexuals the right to marry or to just be uh, you know, legally entitled to do what they want uh, in sexual matters, um, it does not uh, do any harm to others. And no way can you argue that by outlawing that it prevents harm to others. There's no harm done to others, yeah, in, in, in my case, in, in the way that I would argue it. And um, in a book that I read, which is called Justice is Conflict by Stuart Hampshire. I've got the book actually just facing me right now. <laughs> so I, I mean, I, this book, I feel like it, it provided me a good foundation of thought to think about uh, conflict and in, in issues of justice. I think the main issue, we can't, we can't deal with, basically the book argues, we can't deal with uh, uh, matters of substance. So like what Aung San said just now, sometimes these matters are irreconcilable because there is just a conflict based on religious dogma and based on what the other group is seeking, in this case of homosexuals. So we, instead, we have to look at a procedural uh, justice. Does the procedures that we have in our institutions provide a just means to arbitrate among conflicts? And in this case, that's what we need to examine. That's, that's what I feel. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, I think uh, you, you use the word harm, right? And I think it's not actually very clear what the definition of harm is, because we now live in a society where, you know, especially for the millennial generation, there are things like trigger words that 
you know, can cause harm. Um, in Canada, there was a very famous case involving Jordan Peterson, where he was very upset because Canada passed a law requiring, you know, academics to use uh, different pronouns uh, yeah. for transgender um, people. And, uh, you know, and the transgender community were saying, oh, if you don't use a certain kind of language, you are harming me, right? So both sides are actually trying to broaden this definition of harm. So I, I don't actually think you can, we can use harm as, as a way to arbitrate it that clearly. It, I think it's still very contentious. It is contentious for sure. And I think that in this case, um, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, it has to be left up to a system that we have in society that can be democratic and accountable to defining what that harm would, 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 would constitute, you know. So, so I think that's that's what we have to do. Santosh, do you mind if I just go on to the capitalism bit so that we can we can bring back bring you back in into what you just mentioned just now about uh, low wage workers, migrant workers? Let's do that. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So okay. So I'm going back now to the book essentially because the book, like I say, it tries to contend with the arguments from the free market capitalists, right? So let's hear from them first to see what the arguments are all about. So. Uh, Here's a quote, okay? So it, it kind of sums up everything about what these people think of. When you enter a store, no one forces you to buy. You are free to do so or go elsewhere. You are free to choose. And so when even when it comes to, this, to, to workers, they would say, if you don't like your job or career, find another one. And uh, one of the ways that I picked up all these talking points was when uh, the author, Rob Lawson, had a debate with this uh, iron rent um, board chairperson called... Uh, Yaron Brook. So he's quite notorious actually around social media on, on YouTube. So he engages in a lot of debates with uh, leftists. So anyway, I just want to give a quick snapshot of the kind of points he would give. So he would give an example, like he's actually Israeli, and he would say that, you know, many people migrated to the US because of the economic freedoms that the US provides. And to him, which is something I want us to talk about, he doesn't feel that economic power is coercive because it's based on consensual choice. So, for example, if you don't want to use Google because you think that Google is a conglomerate and you know it's too powerful, well, fine, use something else. If you don't want to get a smartphone, sure, use a flip phone. So the idea to him is that when you look at, say, uh, the tech economy, it's a good illustration of how the more freedom you give to a certain economy of, 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 of a certain few, the more you see innovation, the more you see uh, progress. Yeah. And to him, uh, when it comes to arguments about, OK, you know, what about uh, uh, the idea that this monopolization in a, in a capitalist market, a free market, uh, uh, in a free market, he would say, hey, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's it's OK to crush your competition. And the rationale is because I want people to buy my products as long as you don't do it in an illegal way. So he would say, OK, don't do it through fraud. Don't, you know, uh, do something illegal to the other company. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, and if anything, he actually praises people like Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, because he thinks that you know these people have done so much good for mankind because we have access to the cheap products. One of the things he likes to talk about is Facebook is free, Google is free, Internet Explorer is free. So uh, to him, right, the argument is that that's a good illustration of um, capitalist freedom to innovate and to produce. Um, when he was then asked, as a challenge thought experiment, okay, what if you have a mega corporation that owns, say, all the water in a certain area, right? Uh, he would he would say, oh, you know, that's just science fiction. You know, you can do many things. You can buy, you can build your own water sanitation plant. You can build your own well. And uh, again, he will also point to the history of tech and say, you know, years ago, Yahoo would have been the uh, dominant player, but now it's Google. And, you know, because of all these forces, uh, where people are constantly in competition and, and ex maximizing their autonomy. So no one stays in power for very long. It's always dynamic and, and shifting. Uh, there is one thing, though, about capitalists, uh, this free market capitalists, which is they do agree that positive freedom is not something they're concerned with. Um, so in this sense, all they care about is just negative freedom, and that negative freedom is really from economic tyranny, particularly by the state, because in the end, what they feel is that the state doesn't have a right to come in and tell me what to do. Um, and I think a good way of kind of looking at this is um, uh, the way that uh, Yaron would, would argue it is that, you know, you don't want the government to come in and tell you how big your house should be. So you don't have a right to tell me how big my company should be. Yeah. 
So before I go to asking you guys what you think of this, right, I just want to give one good counter example, okay, which is about the positive freedom aspect. So if you look at the history of America, right, there was slavery and no one would argue, no one in their right mind would at least argue that the slaves were freed, right? But then there was emancipation, so the slaves were eventually freed, right? But there were actually questions, you know, even back then where they asked, okay, we are free, but we have no property, we have no money, we have no skills, no education. So in that sense, are we truly free? And I think that's a good illustration where you do have to look at the question of positive freedom. In a more modern context, I, I can give you another good example. Uh, in the American uh, elections, and it happens here a little bit when it comes to our own discourse about healthcare, uh, there's a lot of politicians, a lot of people who would say, we will promote better access to healthcare. But I love this thing from Bernie Sanders, and he says, I have access to buy a Lamborghini or a Ferrari, but it doesn't mean I can do it. And you know that kind of encapsulates, again, the whole notion about positive freedom versus negative freedom. Negative freedom, yes, you, you, you are not prevented from buying a Lamborghini, but it doesn't mean you can do it. So yeah. Okay, so uh, Ang Su, actually, you listened to a very long podcast about uh, F.A. Hayek, Milton Freeman. So why don't you share your own thoughts first? Uh, well, what was interesting about this podcast it was an NPR podcast, three-part series on capitalism. Uh, you know, it, it really took you back in history to that time when in, in the US, uh, you know, Franklin uh, Roosevelt, he started this New Deal program in, in the US, which uh, really increased government spending in a lot of like social aspects. Uh, and it, you know, by all accounts, it, it did really help to deal with a lot of the negative impacts of the Great Depression uh, and really, you know, help rebuild American society, made the lives of workers better. Um, and in that context, the ideas, these ideas, the free market, Milton Friedman, they were really a minority. Like they actually felt like no one was listening to them. They, you know, and they were, they felt that, uh, you know, like Friedrich Hayek, he wrote, he wrote the book Road to Serfdom. He felt that this was the road to serfdom, that it would eventually lead to like the gulags of, you know, the Soviet Union and the worst aspects of, of socialism. Um, and, and, and Milton Friedman himself, I was surprised to find out from this podcast that he grew up in a very poor family in New Jersey, working class, right? And, you know, like you think these are ideas of, of wealthy people and all that, but actually, <laughs> no, he, he, he wasn't. And, and still he believed in these ideas. So it makes me feel that like, you know, like we need to step away from these labels, right? Like nothing's ever absolutely good or bad. Like in, you know, in, in a situation where maybe, yeah, there's too much government spending, uh, some of these ideas might serve a purpose, might be useful as, as, as a corrective. Um, so, but I, I do feel that at this point, their ideas have snowballed and neoliberalism is so dominant that we do need competing ideas. Yeah, um, I'm of the view of polarity thinking and polarity management. So I'm not for binary thinking. It's not a, a, an either or debate. There are, there are arguments for and there are arguments against uh, capitalism or socialism or even uh, uh, communism, right? So I, I think what we want to talk about is to where there is prejudice, where there's bigotry and where there's discrimination or where there is just uh, concentrations of power which could lead to, uh, which could lead to the um, exploitation of people or extraction, over extraction of natural resources from mother nature. Yeah, so I think we need to move away from ideas of capitalism versus socialism to where have we transgressed the rights or dignity of a certain marginalized group of people. Have we discriminated against a group of people or not? Have some members of society fallen or left behind? So it's a lot about looking at power and how some people have lost out in the gains of either of those two extremes. Yeah, and trying to correct the course and find the right balance in between both. So to Ong Su's point, the first thing I would say is that, yes, I think those ideas that Milton Freeman and um, his, uh, coalition had like it had a certain value at that time because 
and I'm not even sure value is the right word, but it has a certain reason for, for, for its existence because they were looking at what was happening in very centralized economies uh, and they were kind of critiquing, criticizing you know, the kind of uh, gross atrocities that have been committed in those days. So I think certainly even up by now, even among the socialists uh, left, uh, there is a reasonable sense that centralized economies can do a lot more harm than good. That being said, though, we, we have an example like China, where, where there's still a lot of centralized uh, or planned uh, economic, uh, yeah, there's a lot of centralized uh, uh, planning from the government. And even in Singapore, actually, you know, we, we can't say that we are totally, we're not as libertarian and free market as compared to a country like uh, the US. We are actually still operating where the, where the government actually takes control of the economy quite a lot. And actually, Singapore provides a very interesting case study of that. Um, the economist Haju Chang, he likes to use Singapore because he says Singapore combines the extreme features of capitalism where we have free trade, we allow uh, foreign talent to come in. So labor in that sense for foreigners is quite mobile and of course capital. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, 90% of the land is owned by the government. And that's not something that you find in other countries like in America. Uh, a lot of housing is provided uh, by public housing is provided for, for the majority of people who live here. So there are all these little aspects that, that explain how uh, for countries to, to prosper and thrive, you may have to have a mix of different uh, techniques, right? And different features. And yeah, going to now San, Santosh's point, uh, yes, you can say that, you know, by now it's almost, it's like the nature nurture debate. Who, who still has that debate anymore? Everyone recognizes that as we speak right now, every country that you look at, there's always a certain mix of, uh, it's, a, it's a mixed uh, economy, right? There's always some features capitalist and some features that are socialist. Like, incidentally on the socialism thing, it's not just about, socialism is not necessarily about the government taking control. Socialism is supposed to be about democratic control of the workforce, uh, of the workers, so the workers actually have a say. So if it doesn't actually meet that that standard, it's not meant to be, uh, it's not meant to be described as socialist, but you get the picture. The idea is that to the capitalist, as long as the government give uh, range for the businessmen and the manufacturers to do their work. Essentially, that's more described to be capitalist. Santosh, I want to bring you to this point because um, you talk a lot about exploitation. And like I said, just now when I brought up uh, the arguments from uh, Alien Rand person, uh, right, he would say, what exploitation? Because even for these people who work from um, developing countries, they have choices to make. And so he would argue that this is not exploitation because they are still making, uh, you know, they, they still have agency to decide where they want to work. They can choose to stay in their home country or they can choose to work in a place like Singapore and they are ready to accept the conditions here. So what do you make of that? What freedom is there if all you're given is a choice between having no wages or no job and a job that demeans you and that exploits you or that extracts everything out of your soul? So I think therein lies the whole question of freedom, right? Because a person who, has, who doesn't have the means for a job of dignity, does that person, from the subjective point of view, feel that they have freedom? As compared to someone else who's got all the freedoms to choose between different jobs because they know they have a safety net. Ang Su, what do you make as a philosopher about this notion of exploitation? And I know you have some issues with uh, Marx. <laughs> well, I think that um, we can do better. I think we can we can work towards a, a better kind of world. And one of one of the basic principles that I want to see is, as far as the destination goes, is that everyone on this planet should have enough. We should just have enough of the basic necessities of, of what we need to live a flourishing life. Secondly, uh, there should be a certain sense of exchangeability because I, I think there's a lot of luck that there's a huge aspect of lottery in life. And I wanna be in a world where I could exchange places with anyone else and still be okay. And I would challenge that Ayn Rand guy, okay, if, if you think the, the lot of that person, the low wage worker is so great because he has all these options, would you want to trade places with him? You know, yeah. and, and, and ultimately that's, that's the key test. 
if, if you don't want to trade places with another person, then you have to acknowledge that, that there's something undesirable in that person's situation. I should say that there are some honest capitalists out there. So Warren Buffett, I think he's been, uh, one of his uh, sayings is that when he was asked something about his, um, how would he consider his measure of success in life or you know, is it replicable by other people? He actually said, no. He said, if I'm just a person living in Bangladesh, there's no way I would be the Warren Buffett I am today. And I think that we need that kind of honest appraisal about our economic realities. So I don't like it when I hear arguments from um, capitalists and, you know, they can be friendly people where they, like I said, the, the, the common argument is that, oh, you know, uh, the, the world is full of opportunities, it doesn't matter how you maximize it. Uh, clearly not. Like, you just need to be living in a different country. You just need to also, um, perhaps, you know, perhaps you want to specialize and have built a career in something where you are not the most talented, where perhaps also in that particular country, that few is not most uh productive or it's not producing the most income. So try to be a basketball player in Africa versus being a basketball player in Af America. So you can be maybe the greatest basketball player in Africa, but you're not going to make as much money as the NBA stars in, in America. And I think that that is the economic reality of today. Um, there are, like as uh, Aung Su said, you know, luck has a huge, huge factor. And I think too many people actually downplay that and don't recognize that we, we need to do more, like what Aung Su said, to maximize the quality of conditions so that people can lead uh, meaningful and uh, decent lives. Uh, incidentally, this is from Michael J. Sandel, the, the tyranny of meritocracy. This is the key word he uses, equality of conditions. And that's you know quite a gargantuan uh, task in the, in the first place. Yeah. Um, can I just go on to the next thing? And then after that, I have you come in again, Santosh. So basically the next point is really, what is the argument from the book? So we haven't even gone there yet. And essentially Rob argues that, look, even when it comes to the idea that capitalism is supposed to promote negative freedom, even he disputes that. So to him, capitalism actually limits both positive and negative freedom. So why? So this mainly comes down to two factors. So one, in capitalism, uh, what happens is that there will be a huge buildup of private power because of the concentration of individual wealth. And the second factor is that because there will be corporate control over the markets uh, and due to that kind of corporate control and dominance, that's why it can lead to things like the destruction of our environmental systems and you know, hence that's why we have climate change. So on the first point, let me just give some data first so it can help with our discussion. So in America, as a comparison, capital is so concentrated that the richest 10% of US household, households, they own 70% of national uh, total national wealth, right? And the top 1% alone owns 35%. And the other important point I have to make about capitalism uh, which we haven't gone into yet, right, is that there is classes. So you got laborers, you got the middle class, and you got the capitalist class. Um, I'll try to go into that a bit later, but the idea here is that for the capitalist class, they don't necessarily need to have high income, but say so it doesn't mean they have to work like the middle class or the laborers. They just need to have um, their wealth in stocks and dividends. And that is the, the ownership of productive capital. So in any case, in America, corporate stock, right, um, it's also very concentrated with the richest 5% holding 67%. So that's, that's a huge one. So what about Singapore? So uh, in a 2014 Credit Suisse report, it pretty much paints the same picture. So the top 1% of Singapore wealthiest hold more than a quarter. So of course, not as bad as the US, but still quite significant. 4.4% of Singapore adults have more than US $1 million and 20% have less than US $10,000. Uh, that's in 2014. So I try to look for something more recent. Uh, in June, just this year, Bloomberg has a report. So I think you guys would know that they reported that we are expected to see a huge surge of millionaires in our country. Uh, we have 5.5% in 2020 and it's expected to surge by 62%. So from 670,000 millionaires to 437,000 millionaires, who knows whether they're local or not. Um, the wealth share of the top 1% is 34% at the end of 2020. And just for comparison's sake, uh, Japan is 18%, so we are 34. South Korea is 24%, and Taiwan is 28%. Yeah. So anyway, why does this even matter, right? Because the, the reason is that at the end of the day, positive freedom is about having a share of the economic wealth, right? And as long as we have the kind of concentration 
uh, it goes back to the question of it goes back to the notion of exploitation. You are not actually sharing that wealth in a much more just and fair manner. Uh, in the book, Rock quotes this uh, black leader, Frederick Douglass. So here's a good quote to kind of encapsulate what I'm talking about. The man who has it in his power to say to a man, you must work the land for me for such wages as I choose to give, has a power of slavery over him, has real, if not has complete, as he who compels toy under the lash. All that a man has, he will give for his life. So just to you know, make it more modernized. So essentially, what do markets do? They really allow people who, who have so much power to, to, to have it in an unaccountable manner because um, the idea here is that this kind of private capital is it's, it's up to the whims of the government to regulate. And in a country like Singapore, for example, they don't even have to give uh, a wealth tax. So the, all the more power they accumulate, all the more they have the wheels and means to um, take over the means of production. So they, they produce the plants, they produce the, the goods that we use. And uh, it gives them so much power to decide our economic conditions. Just as an example, uh, in the book, uh, they talk, uh, Rob talks about this collusion in Silicon Valley. So this happened some years back, where it was actually discovered some of the biggest firms, they actually got together and conspired to keep the wages down of their engineers, software engineers. I mean, this is not like janitors or anything like that. These are pretty well-educated, reasonably well-qualified uh, executives, but yet, they were colluding together to make sure that their wages were not going up. So, um, um, so in any case, also think of it another way, which is right now we always have this competitive drive to attract foreign capital, right? So when you look at someone like Jeff Bezos, uh, he's a man of such power that in America, you know, cities literally try to um, auction themselves. They try to give more and more perks and benefits to attract him to build a manu manufacturing plant in their city. Um, and compare that kind of mobility, that kind of person was able to make so much choices versus uh, Santosh's example of a low wage worker. How much choices does he have? How much freedom of movement does he have, right? So, you know, like the whole thing to me strikes me as, you know, a good metaphor to me, just to make it really simple. Just think of Superman. Who's his nemesis? Lex Luthor. He's just a freaking rich guy. So, you know, even in popular culture, we can recognize that um, money has power and people can do a lot of things with just money. So you, you don't have to be the brightest guy around, although in the comics, yeah, Lex Luthor is not the brightest man on earth, but you get the point. The idea is that with power, there's, you know, so uh, with money, there's so much power you can do. So in any case, just to bring it back to, to our reality for us who, who, who are the working class, um, the idea is that if you look at it, we submit to the dictates of the modern workplace. You know, our boss, tells us what we, how we have to dress. They decide how much maternity leave that we are entitled to have, um, the acceptable workplace or the, the kind of acceptable speech we can have in the workplace, the hours you must work, the pay you're entitled to. So I think we just can't deny the reality that we are subject to the whims of those who own the productive economy and they get to decide you know, how, how wretched our lives would be. Um, again, just to quote directly from the book, uh, today's libertarian intellectuals take their place in a long tradition of defense of power, that's what they're doing, a parade of shame stretching back to the ancient priests who defended the, the righteousness of early kings with fine sounding words. And I think that's how I kind of look at this whole entire ideology. So um, the main question I want to ask you guys first to just cap it off to start off with is economic power. I mean, what do you make of that? Like, do you think it's not something that we have to recognize as having a real tangible effect on our freedoms? Um, I actually think uh, economic power is like, uh, at this point, uh, a potentially very oppressive form of power. There was, there's a philosopher named Elizabeth Anderson, and she wrote a book called Private Government. Yep. And yeah, she makes a claim that companies these days are like forms of government. Like when a worker works for a company, you know, the contracts that they have to sign, uh, it, it really limits a lot of their, their freedoms. Uh, and, and the kind of power that a company has over its workers is the equivalent of what a country has over its citizens. Um, and, you know, I mean, in, in, in the US, there are horrible examples of like uh, people having work in meat packing, uh, uh, you know, uh, slot slaughterhouses. 
where they have to work so fast and productively, they can't even take a break to go to the toilet, so they have to wear diapers to work. I mean, you know, what kind of liberty is that? Um, yep. And I would, I would also further say that in for, I think for the vast majority of wage earners uh, working in these companies, they, they are kept at a schedule and a routine that doesn't really allow them uh, a lot of space to think and to really consider what their options are. So if that, that, I think that goes back to our last session on you know, Jenny O'Dell's book, right? That this, this space of, of being able to like think proactively about the positive freedoms in, in your life is shrinking all the time. A book that will be very relevant to our viewers in Singapore context, it will be, This is What Inequality Looks Like by Chiu Yu Yen. So that is a must read and it goes deep into the subjective lived experiences of uh, low wage workers or people who were just uh, uh, living in poverty in Singapore. And I think sometimes it, it is all about going to the grounds and being with people who don't have high wages, being with people who are uh, living with very low wages. And it's, it, 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 it just is very revealing. So. I mean, I'm, I'm part of uh, a number of ground up movements and I'm, I think it also depends on who you're hanging around with. So like the more I hang around with ground up movements who are there to help people falling through the cracks. So there are so many of these ground up movements. Why is there a need for so many ground up movements? Yeah, there is definitely a need for them because there's a problem that people falling through the cracks of a society that values GDP growth per capita, value added per worker, or productivity or income. This is exactly the form of ideology, economic ideology that actually allows us to, 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 to create a situation where so many people fall through the cracks. So, I mean, instead of just debating this philosophically or ideologically, you know, bring some of these wealthy people who come over to Singapore to Kassel resettlement team where they're looking at some of our people living in rental flats who are elderly as well, you know, come and taste the experience of being lonely and being uh, disrespected, for example, or having very little dignity. Go and spend time with so many of our low wage workers who are in uh, sectors, essential sectors like security or hospitality or cleaning, uh, yeah, spend some time over there and you'll get an idea or a deeper understanding of what, what capitalism and, and inequality is all about in Singapore. So I think it's, yeah, and there is also beyond social services. Go and talk to our uh, formal social service organizations and our informal ground up movements. There, there's so many people who will tell you a completely different picture or side to the Singapore economic development story. Yeah, so I think as much as we want to hear people who have access to mind share and media share, it is important that we give media share and mind share to the lived experiences of hundreds of people, thousands of people who, who don't have the, the basic rights and means to, to a dignified uh, life and livelihood in Singapore. Yeah, so that's just, yeah, I think something that we need to do. Yeah, something, you know, there's this beautiful African proverb, right? Again, like indigenous wisdom. Yeah, there is, so there is like this person, this, yeah, he, he lines all the African kids up and then he says, you know, there are some fruits at the tree, you know, run and the first person to grab the, the fruits, you know, you have it all, you know, and then you can bring it and you can, you can yeah, you can take it for yourself. And what happens after that when he says, ready, get set and go, all the kids run in unison. They hold hands and they run in unison and we ask them, like, why didn't you compete with one another? Yeah, why didn't you do that? Like all the African, like all these children say, no, but I mean, it's all for us. You know, what's the point if I won the race and I had it, I had it all for myself and other people were denied of that wealth? Yeah, so I think it's, yeah, it's, it's just something that we need to contemplate upon. And underpinning this whole capitalistic ideology is this perception that human beings are inherently selfish and the global 
um, society's uh, utility is maximized, the global utility is maximized if everyone maximizes their own self-interest. And that is something, that is an assumption that we need to actually test whether people are inherently selfish or whether people can be altruistic in nature. So there's quite a number of books on that. Um, there may be one that we can try to explore in the future. It's a very, well, kind of recent book by a guy called Rutger Bergman. So it's called Humankind. Uh, in that book, uh, Rutger, just to give some context, he's the person, he's a Dutch sociologist, if I'm not wrong, but in any case, he's, not, he's famous because he was invited to Davos, the Davos Summit in 2019, I think, 2019 or, or earlier than that. Uh, and he became famous because he, he was in the uh, panel of discussion and he said something like, I, I'm like sitting here and I'm just bewildered by what you guys are talking about. You know, you're all rich billionaires, you're talking about equality, trying to make the world a better place, but you guys want to talk about taxes. And, you know, he, he, it was just like everyone felt so, um, what's the word for it, uh, cathartic, just to see him you know, just tell, tell these people off, you know, that at the end of the day, you people sprout so much uh, uh, positive something words, but you're not willing to put your, your money where your foot is, which is you've got to pay more taxes. Yeah. So anyway, uh, before I go into, sometimes I want to ask you something, but before I go into that question, because I did say something earlier about how I like to give kind of a one-on-one on class, because sometimes you, you talk about how um, there are all sorts of other ethos, right? Like, like we can have a more egalitarian, more fair, uh, ethos in our uh, society, but we don't have that right now because of capitalism, because we have to have this competitive ethos instead. But here's the thing to me, I think in capitalism, I think class conflict is kind of inevitable. So what's class conflict? What's class? So I just want to give it, like I said, just one minute breakdown, right? So you got what, because it's also in the book. So how Rob would uh, break it down is that you got the working poor and the characteristics of the working poor is that, you know, they, they can be unemployed, part-time or full-time workers, but Generally, what we see is that they are staying, even despite the work that they do, they are kind of below an adequate standard of living and they depend their income entirely on labor, right? There is nothing else that they, they, they own or they possess or no skill set that they can use uh, to, to maximize uh, their, their income and wealth. Then you've got the working class uh, or middle working class, and that can be kind of a huge uh, broad base of people. So you've got teachers, you may have construction workers, uh, truck drivers or you know people who work essential jobs right now um, then along with that you got the professional class so they're still in the middle class right? the, the professional class and these are the white collar workers so there are people who may hold degrees they may be doctors lawyers accountants so they're still pretty uh, they earn very decent and they can pretty rich but they are not the capitalists because they don't own any uh, kind of uh, uh, assets or dividends or stocks or maybe if they do own, it's, it's quite marginal, it's quite little, it's just to keep up with inflation or something like that. And the important thing about the middle class also is that for them, their capital is knowledge, uh, the credentials that they have from the specialities that they possess. Um, so these people generally, they, they can do quite okay in society, but uh, as one writer puts it, there's always this fear, uh, the writer is Barbara Aaron Wright, there's always this fear of falling behind. So there is this constant fear, you've got to keep up with the Joneses. Then obviously we have the capitalists, which I just mentioned. And um, the idea is that, like I mentioned just now, they, they don't have to be laborers. They don't do any kind of actual laborers work, but they just simply own lots of stuff and they try to ensure that that money is constantly generating returns. So going back to you, Santosh, you, you mentioned something about the work that you do with uh, grassroots organizations and, and NGOs. And I'm curious to hear from you, if you've ever tried to converse with um, the owners of, of companies, right, the capitalist class, and to just reason with them and say, you know, why can't you provide a little bit more, you know, a better living wage for, for your workers? Have, have you tried doing that? Yeah, so in the Alliance for Action for Low-Wage Workers, this is exactly something that we are tackling, and it's actually a very difficult problem because a lot of, uh, because you need to not just have the employers come into the picture and the employee, uh, um, you, you, don't, you need also the support of the consumers. So consumers need to be paying more for the services that are being provided by our low-wage workers. And our society might not be prepared for increase in the consumption prices uh, of the services that are provided for low-wage workers. So employers themselves are caught in a, in a fix. They find it very difficult to raise prices so that their workers can earn more. 
So I can see a general struggle amongst a lot of SMEs who employ these low-wage workers. But where I think a huge lever can, for change can be is the multinational companies who probably subcontract some of their work to some of these small SMEs that employ the low-wage workers to do, let's say, cleaning in their offices or security work to actually select and to give select companies that are giving more dignified jobs, but also to pay more for the services that they're providing. So I think the onus is not just on the employer SMEs who have it very tough, who have a very difficult time to sustain their operations. So it needs multiple stakeholders and multiple actors, including the government, which has a very important part to play that has overemphasized in its resource allocation decisions, sectors which are high wage, high value added per worker or high productivity. I, need, I think we need a lot more actors beyond just the employers of the low wage workers to chip in, yeah, to do their part. So as consumers, are we ready to pay, let's say 20 cents more or a dollar more for the food that we buy at a coffee shop because part of that gains would eventually go back to the low wage workers who are being employed for the services. So this requires a whole of society approach. Hong Su. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I, th I actually think the permanent long-term solution is to remove the separation of owners and workers because that just pits them against each other. I actually think worker cooperatives are the future of capitalism. I mean, that's the only way to save capitalism in my mind. Um, and then that's, that way, the interests of owners and workers then are aligned when workers are the owners. Um, but yeah, I, I wanted to go back to something you said earlier about, you know, like the defenders of uh, free markets and neoliberalism right now are like, you know, uh, the priests of old who are just supporting, you know, this power structure. I think that's, that's what you said. I, 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 I do think that there is this myth or a number of myths uh, that are supporting this unequal power structure. And, and one of the myths really is that people are responsible for the position that they're in. If you are poor or you're a low wage worker, it's because of choices you've, you've made. And I suspect that that actually relates back to our theme, freedom. You know, because we have these incoherent notions of freedom, you know, we actually think that because people are free, therefore they are responsible for everything in, in their life. But this notion of freedom that we have is based on another myth, which is that we are separate beings. Uh, and if, if, you, if I think about this concept of negative and positive freedom, it is based on you know, a very outdated mechanistic view of the self. Like, oh, I am this self and I have to be you know, uh, protected against outside influence. You know, it's like Newton's cause and, and, and effect, right? But the actual reality is that you know, my self is so intertwined and intermingled with everything else you know, that I actually think this idea of negative freedom is something we have to just totally just throw out the window. Yeah, um, so first thing, you've kind of uh, brought forward the conclusion <laughs> of the book, which is um, economic democracy. So you mentioned worker co-ops. So just to give viewers an idea of what you mean by that, which is workers actually having some uh, participation rights in the company or in the institution. Um, and uh, going back to what you said just now about um, the, the freedoms, right? That, that, yeah, the, sorry, the, the idea that um, we need to demolish this myth, right? That we are self-reliant beings and that we are actually contingent and dependent on every, everyone and, and, and the community and the governments and institutions around us. Yeah, I, I think this is also what makes certain people like, say, Jordan Peterson so uh, uh, appealing um, because I think, yes, it, there are moments in our life where we feel like um, helpless, we feel powerless, we, we, we want to feel a sense of um, uh, agency. And I think in that sense, that's why this ideology is so appealing because even if it seems to contradict material reality, 
you want to believe in yourself that you are capable of more than what you are right now. And I think in some sense, uh, yes, there is a certain virtue in that, a certain, a certain very limited one I want, I want to quantify because certainly when, they, when we see, you know, uh, at least to me, right, physical acts of achievement. So we have the Olympics happening right now. I mean, these people went in there being very, very realistic and rational about their choices and about their performances. They may not even be Olympians, right? But there is a certain degree of uh, delusion that I'm that powerful, I'm that strong, and I can conquer my limitations. And that can be helpful in, a, in an instance like that, but not when it comes to the thing that we're talking about. Because I think at the end of the day, you cannot deny material reality and you cannot deny there are certain things that you can't change. Uh, this incidentally will be a good topic for my next video, which is on stoicism. <laughs> so just, just a slight plug. But anyway, right, let me just go down to the conclusion and then let's talk again about this because, you know, um, essentially I want to just point it out, which is the idea about economic democracy. So the, the right wing, the, the capitalist camp, they have a hero, Adam Smith, right? Uh, but they haven't clearly read Adam Smith enough because I'm going to quote from him. And he actually has summarized everything we just said. So, quoting directly, the workman desires to get as much, the masters to give as little as possible. The former are disposed to combine, which is to get together, organize, in order to raise, the latter in order to lower the wages of labor. It is not, however, difficult to foresee which of the two parties must, upon all ordinary occasions, have the advantage in a dispute and force the other into a compliance with their terms. The masters, although being few in number, can combine more easily, and the law besides authorizes or at least does not prohibit the combinations, while it prohibits those of the workmen. We have no acts of parliament against combining to lower the price of work, but many against combining to raise it. In all such disputes, the masters can hold out much longer. A landlord, a farmer, a master manufacturer, a merchant, though they did not employ a single workman, could generally live a year or two upon the stocks they've already acquired. Many workmen could not subsist a week, few could subsist a month, and scarce any a year without employment. In the long run, the workman may be as necessary to his master as his master is to him, but the necessity is not so immediate. Just to say, this quote is 1776. That's how long the human race has to deal with this problem, right? And again, even though... Um, this, this philosopher Adam Smith is routinely quoted as a heroic figure for free market capitalism. He actually has much more nuanced views on this and he's a lot more critical than capitalism as we would like to think. So in any case, um, the idea here at the end of the day is that it seems that the class conflict, at least as the way that even Adam Smith described it, is kind of inevitable. The workers simply have to recognize that the best means of um, uh, get, best means of maximizing their freedoms is to collectively organize and have democratic control over uh, the means of production. Uh, so that can be over investment and, and, produ uh, and production. And um, by doing so, then it goes, it, it ties back in what Ong Su mentioned about solidarity and collaboration and recognizing the dependence that we have uh, with each other. So, um, yeah, that's kind of it. I have a last quote that I want to save at the end. So one thing I want to get from you guys really is how much faith do you put in this idea? Because okay, we heard from Aung Su, but, but you know, what about you, Santosh? I mean, you are working very uh, uh, tangibly with people who are trying to organize, people who are trying to give uh, more power to workers, right? But how is that better going? How is it very? Yeah, I think we need to call for a deeper re-examination of this model of tripartism in Singapore and weigh that model of tripartism and its results with Adam Smith's quote that you just mentioned. Yeah, I think we, we've, not, we've not succeeded. Uh, our model of tripartism has not succeeded and we need to allow workers to organize more in the form of cooperatives as Ansu mentioned or uh, in the form of unions to, to put forth a countervailing force to those who hold the means of production. So I think that is yeah something that I, I wanted to um to to share. Um, there's something else. I mean, I just want to make it very simple, right? A dollar given to someone who is in need 
means a lot more to that person than a dollar gained by a capitalist in the form of dividends or in the form of returns on his investments. Yeah, I think we should, we should look at what it means when we means to the person who is, who's receiving it and, and just weigh it like against our conscience when we make such decisions. And if we grow up as kids, right, learning how to do this from young, then I think we can, I think we can plant seeds that will make for a more uh, egalitarian and uh, equitable world. Yeah, when kids grow up, learning how to distribute power when they have it, and to see how much it means to the person who's receiving it as compared to how much it would mean to the person to just hold on to it or to receive more. I think those are things we can start cultivating in our young people, in our, in our children, so that they grow up to appreciate this, this illusion of separation that we have with one another, that we are skin encapsulated bodies that Ansu just talked about. Yeah. So those are just like some, some things that came to my mind. And spend more time with marginalized communities. In <laughs> Singapore, you'll find so many people who are homeless, people who find it so difficult, like essential workers, even some frontline workers. I've, I've had like experience working as a healthcare assistant. And to look at the lack of dignity that some of these nurses or healthcare assistants have, in the face of doctors who earn a lot more, uh, I think, yeah, there's just so much to, to talk about. International Day for the Eradication of Poverty is coming soon, and we're going to launch a, a poll just to understand poverty better in Singapore. We launched another conversation uh, before Budget 2021 Committee of Supply Debates for on what more can we do for low-income communities. There, we talked a lot more about the lack of rights that so many groups of people have in Singapore, sex workers, for example, or people with disabilities. Yeah, I think we need to just raise awareness to the plight of so many people who have fallen through the cracks. Before uh, I get to uh, having you follow up with how people should find opportunities to hang out with marginalized workers, before I get to that, right, let me go to Ong Su, let me ask you, um, have you hung around investors, capitalists, and see whether they are open to these ideas? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm part of an impact investing network called Tonic. And through that network, yeah, I, I know lots of uh, capitalists, people who are investors, people who own businesses, who, who are very much open to, to these ideas. And I actively trying to create a fairer system. I actually think that we live in a system that is so complex. This capitalist system is so complex that it is too simplistic to just blame the people who are at the top of the system. Because I actually think the, the metaphor is almost like we're in this bus. This bus is out of control and we're over going towards a cliff. And you know the capitalists are the ones you know, holding the steering wheel and, and we're saying, you know, it's your fault, but we don't realize the steering wheel is no longer connected to the bus. You know, it's like, you know, even if that person tried to change the system, like a CEO, you know, like I, I feel the system is almost so complex that, you know, even the, the CEO has limited ability to change the trajectory. You know, it, it really has to be like a collective effort. Um, yeah. Yeah, let me give you two examples uh, uh, on that. So do you guys know a American CEO called Dan Price? D-A-N-P-R-I-C-E. Sounds familiar, but I can't remember. Okay, you know why he's familiar? Because he's the guy that Fox News uh, 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 ridiculed because he gave 7,000 uh, monthly income to all his employees. So he was earning a lot of, uh, you know, it was, I, I can't remember what the nature of his company is. I, I think it's FinTech related. But in any case, he, he was making good money. And uh, just to say also, he's a conservative Christian from what I understand. And he uh, decided that, you know, he was making way too much and he needed to give better fair share of his, uh, of, of the wealth to his workers. So every one of them got $7,000 monthly income. And then when he was asked on Fox News, what Fox News, what he was thinking of, you know, how can you be so stupid? And this is going to be a failed experiment of socialism. Instead, he rebutted like, you know, the workers' lives are obviously a lot better. They were 
uh, a lot more babies born. I remember him saying that um, people could take vacations and, and if anything, profits went up, productivity, I guess, in, depending on how you're going to measure it, it went up. So in any case, right, it, his example clearly illustrates that there is still a lot of power one person can wield. Uh, and, and, you know, if you just need a change of mindset, really, if you just believe in yourself that, okay, I don't need to hoard all this wealth, you can distribute it and you can actually make other people's life a lot better. So, so here's one example. But on the other hand, the other example I have is uh, the Shell CEO. So uh, a long time ago, there was this documentary called The Corporation. Um, I hope one day we'll get to talk about it because it's also a book. But in the film, right, they showed uh, a group of activists go to the, the then Shell CEO uh, uh, residence. So, so these activists went there. They, they kind of like, they didn't really pester him, but they just sort of get it outside. And they actually had a very friendly conversation. They actually engaged with each idea because they wanted to, of course, uh, persuade the CEO to stop engaging in destructive environmental practices. And the CEO actually mentioned at one point, the activists said, we know it's not you, it's Shell as a company, as an institution that does all these things. We know that you don't personally want to do these things, but you are compelled by the system to do so. So you're right on Sue. So at the one hand, yes, individuals can make some change if these individuals have great power. But on the other hand, we do have to change the system overall. And we have to be, uh, in my opinion, fearless about just recognizing that capitalism, whatever one, whatever you want to call it, you know, a mixed economy or whatever, it's it just has to take a different shape. Because even those people who don't consider themselves socialists, people like Robin Wright, who is Robert Wright, who is the ex- U.S. Secretary of Labor, even he speaks like a leftist. He would he would be very much against uh, what is happening right now in capitalism. Yeah. So Santosh, like I said, I don't want to leave you hanging. Um, you did want to encourage people to hang out with marginalized workers. So how can people do that first? Oh, there are, um, there are many. There is a cooperative in Singapore that I'm part of. It's called the Good Space Cooperative. And there are many other community networks. There is the Community Development Network that looks at how can we support people in society or falling through the cracks? There are also formal social service organizations whom you can support. These are one example. It could be your family service centers. And you also have informal grown up movements. And I'll be more than happy to introduce you to this entire network of amazing community leaders from the engineering good to beyond social services to Cassia resettlement team to so many of them looking at different communities. And uh, it will be a pleasure of mine to make a list of all of them in the YouTube channel. So watch out for this list of organizations sure. that are doing their part to support those falling through the cracks of Singapore. Yeah, and we could also have other discussions on things like minimum wage. So our managing director of MES, Ravi Menon, who went on to talk yep. about the possibility of having a minimum wage in Singapore, that is not an impossibility. Uh, also possibilities of having a national basic income. So we need more social safety nets in Singapore. I think those are growing discussions that we're having in our society. So, so lend your voice to such conversations and see what we can do to support those who are needy and those who need it more. Yeah, so let me first say, I think those signs from uh, Ravi Menon are very encouraging to see. Uh, certainly, I think it's great that he, I, I, I've known him a little bit in my years in civil service. So I was actually quite uh, shocked and uh, astonished to see him change his tune according to what I know about him back then. So I think that's very encouraging. But just to back it everything up, I think at the end of the day, as we talk about uh, economic democracy is important. So even if we have political democracy, don't forget your economic rights. Yeah. Uh, Ong so do you have one, anything you want to add before I just want to finish off with one quote? Yeah, actually, uh, I wanted to go back to Adam Smith. Um, yep. You know, I, I think what a really interesting perspective that I came across uh, through Elizabeth and Anderson, the philosopher I talked about earlier. You know, she talks about Adam Smith and and how he really was motivated by he he wanted people to be free, and, and the reason why he was promoting markets was because he the system that he was familiar with was uh, feudalism, and people were serfs, and he thought that markets would give people with talents and craftsmen an opportunity to free themselves from that system, right? And it was actually the same motivation that Marx had a hundred years later. They were actually very similar. The only difference is by the time that Marx came around, the industrial revolution had like just taken off 
And so, you know, Mark saw, you know, how, how like markets had, had become actually quite oppressive to, to workers. And so actually it's possible that if Adam Smith had been born a hundred years later, he would have been actually talking about the same uh, oppressions as Marx was, right? And so this whole, you know, people yeah. have wasted so many thousands of pages and books on this, you know, contest between Adam Smith and Marx. And it's kind of refreshing to just say, you know what, actually they would have agreed with each other. Yeah, uh, it's, I, I really love that you brought this up and you, you managed to uh, explain it so well because Noam Chomsky would also say that like he considered these people classic liberals. Yeah, and they were uh, uh, children of the Enlightenment. And to him, he actually found them not that much antagonistic to each other. It's just a matter of the contingencies and the conditions of their time. That's why they had that particular view. Uh, but actually, if you really dive in deeper, they, they were all kind of more or less on the same page. Of course, there are certain differences when it comes to the ideas, but nevertheless, you are right. Like they, 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 you're right, it's, it's just a waste to talk about like as if they are ideological nemesis when there are a lot more commonalities you, you can find. Yeah. Santos, you want to say anything before I kind of finish up? No. Okay, so yeah. why I wanted to finish with this, right, is because uh, to the viewers, if you don't want to hear from three guys in Singapore, take, it, take a word from the smartest man on earth that we know, Einstein, who wrote this in 1949, <laughs> okay? Uh, so let me just say, let me just quote from him. The economic anarchy of capitalist society as it exists today is, in my opinion, the real source of the evil. Insofar as the labor contract is free, in inverted quarters, inverted commas, what the worker receives is determined not by the real value of the goods he produces, but by his minimum needs and by the capitalist requirement for labor power in relation to the number of workers competing for jobs. Private capital tends to become concentrated in the few hands partially because of competition among the capitalists and partially because technological development and increasing division of labor encourages the formation of larger units of production at the expense of smaller ones. The result of this development is an oligarchy of private capital, the enormous power which cannot be effectively checked even by a de democratically organized political society. Moreover, under existing conditions, private capitalists inevitably control direct or indirectly the main sources of information, press, radio, education, something which we didn't talk about, by the way, it is thus extremely difficult and in most cases quite impossible for the individual citizen to come to objective conclusions and to make intelligent use of his political rights. I am convinced there is only one way to eliminate these grave evils, namely through the establishment of a socialist economy accompanied by an educational system which should be oriented towards social goals. In such an economy, the means of production are owned by society itself and are utilized in a planned fashion. So that's Einstein in 1949. Uh, I mean, if you're going to take down the one of the brightest scientists that we have on Earth, I mean, I would say you have a huge time. <laughs> Douglas, did you, did you fact check this? Because, you know, this could be fake news, man. It's, just, like, <laughs> it's astonishing that Einstein said that. I mean, you know. He did. He did. And actually, like, um, I, I, I really would like to cover it one day uh, on the topic of socialism. And, you know, one of the things most people don't realize is that all the people that we worship, Martin Luther King, Helen Keller, Albert Einstein, Bertrand Russell, they were all democratic socialists. And I think um, there, there is this contention actually um, among the left that, um, you know, we, we've been whitewashed uh, in society about, about these individuals. You know, we don't realize how radical they truly were. And if you're going to take them seriously at their word, I mean, we have to pay respect to what they believed in. So, yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, so that sums up for today. And thanks a lot, guys. And uh, we'll see you in the next video. Great. Thanks, Doug, for guiding us through this. That was very good. No problem. Enjoy the conversation. Thank you, Doug. Thank you.